on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. Today we're talking about maple syrup. This isn't just a sugar, it's a classic wild food that comes with this whole suite of natural compounds that do amazing things inside our body. We've talked before about our wild food trifecta. Maple sugar, acorns, and wild rice. Once you add fishing and hunting, suddenly a significant amount of your calories can come direct off the landscape. As it warms up, the gases start expanding, pushing sap down and out through the tap. These practices connect you to these species that are otherwise just building materials. Like here, this is a maple floor we're on, yeah. right? It's not even just identifying the maple, but you want to know exactly which species of maple you're looking at because it affects how much volume of syrup or sugar you're going to get. I wish people could experience, you're just walking out into this forest and it's giving you sugar. Yes, all of your sugar for the year. Episode number 68 of the Wild Fed Podcast, In the Sugar Bush, your guide to maple syrup with Arthur Haynes is brought to you by Sir Thrival. Sir Thrival's annual colostrum sale is on now, and all colostrum products are 20% off with the coupon code HEALTHY2021. Colostrum is a sophisticated antiviral immune-boosting superfood that's well-known for its digestive tract regenerating properties, as well as its ability to assist in workout recovery and lean muscle gains. I use colostrum just about every day in my morning blended drink. I start with a strong tea of chaga mushroom as the base, add frozen wild blueberries, soaked chia seeds, cacao nibs, my homemade maple syrup, a little nut butter, some vanilla, and a heaping pile of colostrum powder. I've been known to vastly overshoot the suggested serving size. Once you start using colostrum in blended drinks, nothing comes close to giving you the flavor and texture that it does. It's a truly functional food. Get over to SirThrival.com and check out the entire product line. And be sure to use the coupon code HEALTHY2021 to get 20% off all colostrum products. Wild Fed is also brought to you by the Farmer's Juice. Cleanse, nourish, and rebuild your body this winter with the incredible juices from the Farmer's Juice. Go over to thefarmersjuice.com and take a look at their juices. Each one contains a full pound of fresh organic produce with absolutely nothing artificial added, and they deliver direct to your door. They've got all the ingredients you're looking for, and their delicious juices stay fresh for up to 30 days. In addition to their complete line of juices, they've also got a variety of wellness shots and plenty of low-sugar and keto options, too. Check out their Mostly Greens box. That contains 20 juices and 10 wellness shots. Their variety pack, that's also 20 juices and 10 wellness shots. And their wellness shot box, which is 30 of their wellness shots. Again, go over to thefarmersjuice.com and use the coupon code WILDFED for up to 8 bucks off your order. Again, it's thefarmersjuice.com. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The Wild Fed Podcast, a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you. It's always a pleasure to have Arthur Haynes back on the show, and today we're talking all about maple syrup, maple trees, and of course, our own home sugar bushes. Arthur and I, along with our wives, were together last weekend for an ice fishing trip in the north woods of Maine, but this show was actually recorded some time ago. In fact, it was the second episode of Wild Fed we ever recorded. Now, I've been hanging on to it, waiting for the maple syrup season. Now, I've been holding on to it, waiting for the maple syrup season, or what we Mainers call the sugarin' season, and it's almost here. Now, you may not live in an area where maple trees can be tapped for syrup, but I hope you'll listen in anyways, as it's a pretty interesting and informative and engaging conversation. And if you are in an area where maple trees can be tapped, I want to encourage you to give it a try this year. Even if it's just one tree, even if you don't want to cook it down to syrup and you just want to try drinking the incredible fresh sap that comes direct from the tree. That's how I first got started and you'll hear about that in this episode. In other words, you can start slowly. You don't need to go out and get all the gear to get started. My first year of really making syrup was in 2017, so this will be our fifth season, and over those years, we have continuously improved and upgraded our system and our yield. The last few years, I've made about eight gallons of finished syrup per season, and just before recording this, I checked my inventory. It's early February now, and I'm currently running a surplus of just over six gallons. 
This is really encouraging since the surplus has risen a bit each season since I started. I remember that as we started our second year of sugaring, we were just using up the last of our first year syrup when we started boiling off the new stuff. Each year since, I've had a growing surplus by the time the new season has actually begun, and I've been able to gift a little bit more to friends and family each year too. Now, at a spare six gallons, my surplus puts me a full year ahead of my household sugar needs. So I'm hoping for a good 2021, and then I'll be able to put away as much this year as I have in previous years. So I'm just getting all my gear staged out, planning my route through the forest, and hoping some of the trail cutting and canopy opening we did last summer pays off this season. Listening back through this interview has me so excited to get started. I'm looking forward to the extra manual labor each day, since these main winters leave us a lot more sedentary than we like. For me, all that work is crystallized into the flavor of our syrup, and I taste it each morning when I sweeten my morning smoothie with a tablespoon of our maple syrup. It's sugar we've earned from our landscape, a wild terroir that's derived from our own backyard. Hey, I'm here with my friend Arthur Haynes. Arthur, tell us a little bit about your background for people who uh, are just joining us. Well, uh, I'm a botanist, (laughs) so I I work with plants as most of my work. And as part of that work, I work as a plant taxonomist and I work in the conservation field for regionally and globally rare species. And I obviously, the nice thing about using those skills is they fit in really well with foraging, medicinal Mm -hmm. plants, primitive living skills. I mean, indigenous people were expert botanists and so it's nice to not have those obstacles of identification and understanding the ecology stand in your way when it comes to interacting with your landscape. And you have uh, in addition to that, you run a school uh, here in Maine. Talk a little bit about that. Um, the Delta Institute of Natural History, and I run it out of my home. You've been to many mm-hmm, times. And the classes there are designed to help people uh, gain a connection to wild plants. Um, while they teach a variety of things, most of them center on using plants in some way. Um, even the bow building classes, mm-hmm. the archery, is centered on the wood and the trees that we use for those things. And to give people a little more context too, um, I know you have a background um, in, in the field doing a little bit of work with uh, ornithology. Mm-hmm. Um, I know you've done um, a lot of what we call primitive skills or um, I think applied archaeology is another way people yeah. sometimes say that. So uh, bow making, flint napping, things like that. But then a lot of our, uh, the kind of the keystone of our friendship is has been around uh, a lot of hunting and gathering stuff together, yeah. um, especially as of the last few years. Um, so I want to fill people in on that a little bit too, that in addition to uh, the work that you do with plants, uh, you're bringing quite a lot of wild food calories into the household as well. And in particular today, we're talking about maple syrup. And I want to ask um, how your season's been and how your year's been. I mean, this is one of the better years um, in a long while it, for a number of reasons. One, we had a great flow and it's still, we've probably got another week or so before it winds down, but also with a budding community in, mm. in place now, there's also help. And on those days where, you know, it doesn't sound like much, I usually have between 50 and 55 taps on a really good day each bucket can be filled to two and a half gallons that's attached to the tree. And I've got to bring all that back about a quarter mile to where the evaporator is. Mm -hmm. And it's just a tremendous amount of work. And so having people that assist with that now, it's amazing. But this year was phenomenal. Yeah. And last year was the year that you helped me get started here. Yeah. A lot of my systems are based off systems that you showed me. So year two, I've, I think now we're starting to bifurcate slightly as I'm developing my own systems, but they're definitely based in what you showed me. Yeah. And even you helping me identify the trees here, which if people are, are wondering like, well, you didn't know how to identify a maple tree, it's different in when there's no foliage, right? I think my right. initial observations were always based on trees with foliage. Yeah, and it's not even just identifying the maple, but you want to know exactly which species which of maple species. you're looking yeah. at because it affects how much volume of syrup or sugar you're going to get. Yeah, exactly. Um, Now I had messed around, I remember the uh, house I lived in before this one, and uh, I had, you know, one of those old maple trees that you'll see, uh, big sugar maple on the uh, edge of the road there. And I had tapped that a couple of years and messed with drinking the sap and boiling a little on my stovetop. But the last two years I've been much more serious about it. And uh, (laughs) one of the things I found interesting this year is you live only about an hour away, but <clears throat> oh, we're totally different Completely in our timing. Different. So a bit of its altitude. Um, yeah, and, and we're also, we're in a small stream valley. And so there's a north slope that comes yeah. down. 
and our trees are, or most of our stand, our sugar bush as it would be called, is right at the bottom of that north slope. And I mean, we were two weeks probably behind you in some cases. Oh, I would say maybe even, even more. Maybe more, yeah, because yeah. I was tapping in early February. And, and, and we're not that different. We're in yeah. the same region. <laughs> And this year you cooked a lot of your sap down to sugar. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, sugar is of course, I mean, obviously maple syrup was made um, by hunter-gatherers and indigenous people, but without the jars that we have today that mm. seal to keep out any, you know, foreign uh, whatever pathogens from getting inside there and starting to create mold and mildew, you end up with the situation where that wasn't an option for them except for relatively immediate use. And so they would take theirs all the way down to sugar where the syrup would get reduced even further and then paddled so that it granulated as it was the moisture was driven off. And that they stored for long periods of time. Uh, a lot of groups that did them stored them in some type of folded birch bark container, uh, paper birch in most of the cases. And that was the primary way they held onto their maple sap was in this reduced sugar mm -hmm. form. Yeah, I was just speaking with somebody yesterday <clears throat> and we were talking a little bit about the history and, uh, and how containers were at such a premium in the past. This is something you and I have talked about <laughs> yeah, on the yeah. Roger Yourself podcast that that containers are something we take for granted and that in fact we have too many containers now and in fact our <laughs> right. landfills are are filling up with containers such that it's easy to think like containers are abundant in the world but but without industry right and for the people who lived you know three and a half million years or you know evolving on this planet as hunter gatherers like containers were were at a premium right so so that's an interesting component that we take for granted syrup being um, I don't know, I think of it as a traditional food, but really it's That's once right. containers were more readily available. It, it, was, it was always present while people were gathering sap here, but it wasn't the way the sugar was stored right. for yeah. long periods yeah, of time. Yeah, it was syrup in the cooking process down, down to sugar to, yeah, for a exactly. period of time. Yeah, it's really interesting. So um, what do you think your total yield will be? Oh, I mean, again, we don't have a, a big setup, you know, in terms of um, trying to go for massive volume. What we do is we try to do all of our in-house sugar use is all maple mm -hmm. so that we're using no sugar cane, no sugar yep. beets. That's our yep. goal. Um, and there's ecological reasons, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> for doing that. Yeah. Um, other than some honey for mead making, of course, maple syrup and maple sugar are the only sweetener Primary we sweetener. use. Yeah. And we probably um, somewhere in the eight to nine gallons for our small community and that takes us all the way through the year usually with just a little left over so that if we have um, a year where there isn't as big a yield we have a little surplus from each year mm -hmm. last year I just made it through I was pouring right. off the last of it <laughs> and uh, I'm, it's been interesting with a lot of the things that I've forged in the last few years developing that confidence in the cycle that as I start running out, there's that sense of scarcity that comes and learning to trust that the ecosystem will provide yeah. again, maybe not as abundantly some years as other years, but but you know, learning like I can relax into that, that I can get access to these things again because I was somebody who always bought bulk food and I would be like, oh, I'm getting low on that time to order and make sure that I keep it, <laughs> you know, so like watching my, my supply dwindle down just as the season. I comes. mean, it is the hunter gatherer philosophy yeah. of the earth will provide. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And like learning and, and how can you really know that, you know, until unless you, you've actually, yeah, yeah. Understood. and I think people who practice agriculture um, as a subsistence method feel that to a degree, but that the system is such that you're kind of. Um, altering the landscape in order to get what you want to come out of it and there's a bit of a fight there so yes. the way that we're doing it, it provides a un I think not to not to try to compare them but it just it, it gives you a unique insight into like how the earth provides I find that fascinating but uh, you were also talking about using that as your primary like sweet carbohydrate mm -hmm. um, I want to kind of put in context too that living here in Maine like we do that we've, we've talked before about our wild food trifecta of calories, at least plant calories. Can you talk about that too? Because I think um, we have a few foods here that are really crucial to us. Other ones that are easy to miss if we if we had to be away or we couldn't harvest or it was a bad year for something. Right. I can live without fiddleheads, but it's like, it's maple and a couple other plants. Yeah, yeah I mean, for, for us, the ones that we really try to gather in abundance when those years provide them, it's maple sugar in some yeah. form, it's acorns, which are sometimes not available, mm -hmm. and wild rice. And these are the, they're 
just beautifully storable foods mm -hmm. with far more nutrition than most people realize. And I'm even talking about the maple sugar itself um, and really serve as the plant component yeah. of our wild foods. I mean, certainly we do some foraging, but it's relatively limited. It might be teas from Eastern white pine and some rose hip gathering and things. But let's face it, we're locked up in, I mean, some pretty cold weather, deep snow and mm. plant foods are not abundant on our landscape. Yeah. You know, last night I was talking with Avani and she was saying, we were talking about acorn pancakes with maple syrup. And she was like, what I like about it, and I hadn't thought of this before, it was kind of a unique insight to me was, She's like, the last thing we harvest in the year is acorns. And, the, and then the yeah. first thing that we harvest is the maple. And when we're eating those together, it's sort of like tying the two yeah, cycles very much. together. Yeah, I think that's really needed. And one thing that's been cool about um, harvesting those plants is once you add fishing and hunting, suddenly a significant amount of your calories can come from the landscape, direct off the landscape. I mean, that'd be really hard to do. If you took those plants out of the equation, they, they oh, do provide. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're really significant. Yeah. Um, I mean, in our house, especially my wife, Sarah, I mean, she's eating acorn pancakes like every other day, it seems. It's a <laughs> yeah. really huge food for her, especially through the winter season. Yeah. And once the summer comes and the diversity, you know, jumps up tremendously, um, they subside. But only about only this <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're getting close now. There's some greens peeking up though, yeah. I'm excited. Um, I wanna talk with you, uh, because you have that botanical background and a, a deep understanding of, I think in some ways, I don't think you would say this, but I'll say that I think it, you have knowledge of plants in a way that oftentimes botanists don't necessarily have the, the same depth because that you eat these plants. Oh, I understand. Right, so I think yeah. like, uh, there's a there's the knowledge component, but then there's this experiential component that you have. And I've been talking to different people about maple, but I really wanted to dig into your mind a little bit on the genus Acer and uh, see what you could share with us about this uh, group of plants, this uh, species of plants. I'm sorry, this genus of plants. Um, I've been fascinated by the idea that you, the industry so focused on sugar maple, but as you know here, I'm, I'm getting my sap from red maple, yeah. and it is just indistinguishable for me. Taste-wise. Taste-wise, yeah. it's the same thing. And uh, since talking more about tapping trees, I'm hearing from so many people who are working with so many different species, and I'm just fascinated by it. What can we learn about Acer? I mean, you look at, just say, the indigenous of this continent, and uh, there are a number of species that were used. Essentially, most maples, um, if they are large enough to tap, because tapping really small trees, you end up taking a really high proportion of the sap that is you know, present in that tree. You, you make an impact, so we wait until there's certain size and if trees reach that size of almost whatever species you're good to go um, they all have sucrose as their primary sugar uh, they vary in the Can content talk, let's talk about that a moment yeah, sucrose sure. just so that people get a sense of what sucrose is I mean people hear the term and I think most right. people would associate it with sweetness um, but let's be specific about that molecule for a second just break that down I mean that, that's the the sugar that we have on the American table mm -hmm. you know it's this disaccharide fructose and glucose that's put together and you get this you know amazing pure we I think I think of it often, particularly the table sugar, because obviously coming from a very domesticated background, that's my view of what pure sweet is, Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? And obviously maple gives that same sweetness, but with all of these flavors from the caramelized sugars right. that are in that. Right. Um, but yeah, m maples all provide this particular sugar. Um, all of, I should say, all of the ones that I'm aware of in North yeah. America. Black maple is a species while rare here in the Northeast, is tapped in other parts like the Great Lakes region. Uh, silver maple, a species that grows along our river floodplains, uh, very similar to red maple um, in, in many ways and in its sugar concentration. It's a little less than sugar maple, but still, you know, totally yeah, usable. Yesterday, talking to uh, somebody with the state who uh, works with the maple syrup industry, <clears throat> she was talking about um, sugar maples primarily. And I wanted to ask, uh, because silver maples are a riparian tree, correct? Yeah, almost exclusively. Okay. And um, some lakeshore floodplains as well okay. but yeah they're very tall near to water. water yes yeah and then red maple um inhabits bogs even right? yeah it, go, it runs the whole gamut oh, of so upland can, and well drained soil to wet soil that's right um sugar maple but but typically richer 
more well-drained soils, um, the kinds of things that we would expect. While they can occur on floodplains, they're on the higher terraces. Okay. Yep. So that not the ones that would be flooded with every rain event kind right. of thing. So in other words, like if you live in a very wet area or you live in a very dry area that's in the range of maple, it's not going to affect your ability you to You have access sugar. to something. And, and red maple is what I used to tap uh, prior to moving to the home you that I'm in now. You guys sugar maples there? And, yeah. And there mm -hmm. were no sugar maples in Bowdoin where mm -hmm. you visited. And uh, that was all red maples. And yeah. it was wonderful. Yeah. Again, right. indistinguishable yeah. in taste. Yeah. Question that I had too is about the striped maple, mm -hmm. which seems like this oddball of the <laughs> genus, right? Um, <clears throat> I've never seen one probably bigger than seven, eight inches maximum. It's a short tree, um, but it is uh, in the genus. Mm -hmm. um, do you know of anybody who successfully tapped it? Obviously, it would, at its largest, it's just at the size where you would be. Yeah, it, it just doesn't reach the size that yeah. it ever gets used. And it is kind of an oddball because it tends to be found, um, obviously it'll be in middle-aged forests, but it's a species that's also associated with older forests. And many species that grow in old forests are these long-lived, very tall species mm -hmm. so they can compete for light and wait for many years if yeah. they need to until a tree falls to move out into that light gap. And striped maple is the opposite of these. It's a small and short-lived mature forest tree. 80 years or so is frequently oh, wow. where it maxes out. So it's an Versus oddball. what would we expect out of a silver maple, a red maple? Oh, I mean, maple. like a sugar maple, I mean, we can get m m centuries of age on these things. So they're very different. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's really amazing. And then another, uh, I don't want to say an oddball, but another one that sort of seems to linger on the outer edge of the genus is the box elder. Mm -hmm. um, I was learning yesterday that there is a small um, box elder uh, syrup industry in British Columbia, which yeah. surprised me being that far west. Um, do we have uh, many cases here in Maine where people are tapping that? Do you know? Not that I'm aware of in Maine, and they may be, but nothing commercial. Uh, box elder is also called ash-leaved maple because instead of having those sort of obvi uh, you know, the obvious shape of maples, that kind of palm-like lobing, this is a uh, has a leaf that's divided into leaflets yeah. like an ash tree has, yeah. and so it looks its leaves just look totally different, but. Uh, we do have this as a native species in western New England, massive trees that will sometimes grow in the floodplains and can be tapped and boiled down into sugar in the same way. Yeah, and the, the, w the mechanism by which <laughs> sap flows, this is something I wanted to get into as well, and I found even when I talk to people in the industry, it's not well understood. Right. Um, I did uh, kind of nail somebody down on it yesterday who said, um, yes, the science isn't fully accepted yet. Um, it's still partially theoretical. Right. Um, but I wanted to talk about that. The, uh, the assumption is, I think of, of the layperson walking up to it, is that the sap is being drawn up through the tree and it comes out the hole. It's right. a far more complicated uh, system than In that. maples, yeah. it's way more complicated. Yeah, and maples are kind of unique in this way too, from what I understand, that, that most trees uh, function slightly differently. So um, another tree we tap here is the, the birch trees, right? right? Um, who have a different, I don't know if you would say pump, but a different mechanism. Essentially, that, yeah. That sap. So could you explain a little bit about how uh, maples move their sap around that time of year? Yeah, I mean, the maple is, is really interesting because the it has these long vessels that draw up you know, fluids through the tree. And in the springtime, they're also pulling those sugars up that have been stored in the roots. And those are going up to the crown of the tree to feed the growth of the leaves and the flowers. Those sugars are needed to, you know, fuel that cellular growth. But they're not sort of pushed up by the roots. What happens is these, these vessels have fibers that are next to them, and those fibers are rich in carbon dioxide gas. And when it gets cold, those gases shrink, just like everything does, and it dissolves into the sap. And, and as all these gases shrink down, there's a vacuum The, the gases, created. the carbon dioxide dissolves yes. into, so it become, it's in, in solution. And, and because it is uh, smaller, it's contracting down, you're getting this lower pressure in the stem of the tree. And so it essentially, there's a suction that pulls so it's not getting pushed, it's getting pulled up into the tree. It goes up and then from, from, okay, from so the roots. Now this is yep. liquid water because it's starting to freeze outside. These, right. That's causing, so the, the, 
crown of the tree, the trunk of the tree is experiencing that ambient cold temperature. There's still liquid water underground because that's not frozen yet. And that liquid water is being pulled, pulled up, up by that vacuum. Is that yes. then mixing with those sugars? In the well, they're, they're, the sugars are dissolved in okay. that liquid yep. and, and it goes up. And then what happens is during the day, in the springtime here, it will warm up. And as it warms up, the gases start expanding. Mm -hmm. And as the gases expand, they start pushing sap down and out. Yeah. And that's what causes the sap to come out. Yeah. It's actually not coming uh, immediately from the roots to the yeah. tap. It's coming from the crown and the stem yeah. and out through the tap. I had thought I understood it for a minute. And I was like, oh, okay, it's going up into the top and then it's running down and out the hole. And then it's like, no, it's actually pressurized. Pre yes, yeah. because the gases are expanding and <clears throat> contracting based on the temperature. And that's why we need the below freezing temperatures mm -hmm. to get the gases to contract enough. And then the above freezing temperatures for the gases to expand to push things out. And if you don't have the contraction to pull the liquid up that has the sugars, and then the expansion to push it out, if you don't have both of those happening cyclically, eventually sap stops, stops flowing in the spring until yeah. the conditions improve. Until they improve. We um, were on a commercial sugar bush recently, and right. <laughs> um, what we saw was, um, of course, they're using that blue tubing, which has become um, sort of an industry standard. <clears throat> the trees are tapped by a seven sixteenth, uh, sorry, a five, are they five sixteenths? What are the it's approximately, I think that's what five it is, 16. yeah. So there's a small tap in right. there, but they have a little floating ball one-way valve, <laughs> yes. and the reason is when that that low pressure you were talking about as those gases contract, they'll it, pull back, yeah, pull sap back in through and they're really concerned about contamination in their systems. Right. So they have that little one-way valve. So that was, obviously for us, that's not an issue. At all. Because it's right. just, you know, they're just open to air. But right. um, I thought that was really fascinating that it creates that much suction. Yes. That it can draw sap back into the tree. And, and I mean, even the sap flow in a day, even when there is below freezing temperatures and above freezing temperatures in the day, um, the barometric pressure still matters because this is all pressure driven. It's a carbon dioxide. The barometric pump pressure of the air. Of the air itself. Is a, is a variable. Yes. Oh, I never really thought about that. Which is one of the reasons why sometimes uh, during storms, like a rainstorm in the early spring when there's still snow on the ground, the temperature might not have gone down very much and it might have not come up very much, but the pressure has gone down so much. During Outside that, the tree. Yes, exactly. Uh, the, during that low pressure system, that sap can really Starts come out. Moving. So sometimes during those never, rainstorms, we get tons of sap. I hadn't thought about that. I yeah. hadn't like, observed it because I wasn't thinking about it. That's really interesting. Yeah, it's one of the variables. That's one a perfect way to describe yeah, it. Yeah, oh, that's fascinating. Um, another question I have is those sugars that are stored in the roots. Those are sugars that were made through photosynthetic activity the season before. By the leaves, that's in right. The year before. Yep. Are there any, you know, here we have um, experienced many different um, blights and infections. Um, how are maple trees doing in the Northeast? And is there anything that's uh, hindering? I know there's a, what is it, tar? blot or something on the leaves? Yeah, th there certainly are a few pathogens. Uh, as I understand, there's nothing going on with, say, the butternut canker, the emerald ash borer, Dutch elm disease, and things of that scale yet. Though there is concern about the climate change we're experiencing, because sugar maples are a cool climate species. And if they are not able to shift their range north mm. with warming temperatures, because these species take time to move uh, they don't just sort of like automatically say, oh, go. we'll just go over here. It happens very slowly. And if the change in climate occurs too quickly, they don't adapt yeah. to this. What about um, the red maple and the silver maple? Uh, to my knowledge, it's the same, that these They'll are still species. By these temperatures yeah, uh, um, to a degree. You know, red maple is really interesting, though, because it's Maine to Florida. It's, it goes the entire Isn't eastern seaboard. Range? Yeah, it's wow. much larger than, say, sugar maple. Okay. Uh, let's explain for folks why you, we were just talking about the, what pumps the sap in the spring. Right. Um, let's talk about the temperature gradients that, that cause this and why the, the range of maple is greater uh, than the range in which s uh, sugar can be made from them or, or, or syrup can be made from them. When, when you say... Uh, so, so we have uh, our, the range, like you said, of red maples all the way down to Florida. Oh, gotcha. But down in Florida, they are not producing maple syrup. So right. when we look at maple syrup production, we're looking primarily in the New England states, That's over right. to New York, a little bit further west, That's and up into Canada. But 
we're not seeing it down in Florida. Right, and, and you just, you, frankly, you don't get the temperatures that you need mm -hmm. to drive the sap out of the tree. Okay. Um, because again, without having the cold weather, that mm -hmm. below freezing temperature that contracts the gases. And, and you, you, people sort of know this when you boil water, as you heat the water, the gases are escaping. It can hold less gas inside it. Mm -hmm. And in the tree, those gases have to go some places. They press outward, they're driving sap out, mm -hmm. right? But as you cool If we water, hadn't made a hole in the tree, they would primarily drive it unless there was other holes made by woodpeckers yes, or- up and flashes. down, that's right. Right, so it, it would just be, the purpose is not for us to make maple syrup, <laughs> but it's to feed these buds, yes. which are about to open into flower and, right. then, and then go to leaf, is that essentially? Yeah, right? um, the, the leaves and depending on the species, um, for example, sugar maple flowers pretty early. The flowers are coming out about the time the leaves are. Red maple, though, flowers before the leaves appear. And so you'll see those red buds expanding, mm -hmm. and they'll be out for a while even before the leaves right. have emerged. So some maples um, flower before leafing out, and some are kind of, at the same kind of time, and others are yeah. later, depending on what species you're looking at. Right. And so I'm kind of imagining, as you're talking about, I'm imagining a bellows. It's a lot like that, right? That as, as I stretch it out, it draws air in, and as I press it, it forces it back out. I mean, it's that an, hot and cold contraction and expansion is causing Yeah, it's effect. just, it's a carbon dioxide yeah, bellows. Yeah. <laughs> Are there, what is, uh, and this may not be you know, something to know about, but, but what about as we move uh, across the temperate zone into um, Asia, let's say, um, into Siberia, you know, mm -hmm. um, south of the boreal forests. Are there maples there? There are species of maples. I mean, Asia is loaded. It's another center of diversity. And it's not an area that I've studied much, but they're really cool looking at the images. I mean, there are species of maple that grow in China that have white exfoliating bark that you would swear was paper birch. Wow. So a yeah. huge center of diversity okay, in but Asia. But they're not producing syrup over there in any significant I honestly way. don't know if yeah. they're do okay, or not. Good, yeah. And I'm guessing yeah. that if they get big enough trees mm -hmm. and they're in the right temperate zone where they get these cold springs, that somebody's probably possible. doing it. Yeah. I have read that um, Europeans returning back to Europe after early visits here went back to say, we got to start doing this in Europe, but they, the conditions just weren't right for right. the maples there. Right? Yeah, I, I think they're dealing with a Gulf Stream and things yeah. like England is just maybe not getting the, for what's left of the forest, mm -hmm. you know. Um, what do we know about um, the historical methods? I'm curious about, um, you know, here I'm working with stainless steel. I can cook oh, on yeah. propane. I have, you know, these beautiful buckets that are, have been made of steel that I can truck the sap around with. Of course, we're seeing at the commercial level vacuumed tubing attached to the trees with wireless sensors and, yeah, yeah, you know, right. I mean, very sophisticated equipment. How was this done in the not really that distant past when we look at big human history, I and mean, it's really recent. Um, when Europeans first came over, what did they see in the sugar bush? We'll get right back to the show in a moment, but first, WildFed is proud to announce our newest show sponsor, the Salmon Sisters of Alaska. Salmon Sisters delivers frozen and smoked wild salmon direct to your door, as well as some other wild Alaskan species like cod and halibut. The Salmon Sisters, Emma and Claire, and their all-women team are headquartered in Homer, Alaska, where they make their livelihood harvesting wild seafood from Alaska's pristine and bountiful waters. Check out their Wild Alaska Coho Salmon Box for vacuum-sealed individual serving size portions, or their Wild Alaskan Sockeye Salmon Box for full fillets that'll feed your whole family or fill your freezer. They've got a smoked sockeye box with ready-to-eat smoked salmon in pouches. Hey, I keep one of those in my backpack for food emergencies. And their smoked salmon tins, which are also ready to eat. They've also got a beautiful cookbook, super cool women's clothing designs, and their own custom line of printed extra tough branded boots. Go over to aksalmonsisters.com to check out their store, where the coupon code WILDFED gets you 10% off your first order of wild fish. And if you want to get to know Emma and Claire a bit better, listen back to episode number 51 of this podcast. It's called Made of Salmon, the Salmon Sisters of Alaska. And again, you can find them at aksalmonsisters.com and the coupon code is WILDFED. Now, back to the show. Before metal was introduced, they mm -hmm. saw something uh, very different. Of course, as soon as metal pots especially were introduced to the indigenous people here, they adopted them because they were amazing tools for mm -hmm. doing exactly this, reducing sap down to make maple sugar. Um, but it was really interesting. Wait, are you saying that that kind of drove the desire?
pots or are, it would it would certainly be factor, one yeah. of the yeah. things that would do I mean the, a metal pot is amazing compared with a bark or a clay vessel which have um, a more limited lifespan mm -hmm. um, but yeah, yeah much you, more limited. right um, but they were also you know you look paper birch was one of the really huge things that were, was a big part of the maple sugar technology that was being practiced, um, they made the containers. What we use is the pails or now we're just, you know, some people will be using blue plastic tubing to go to some receptacle. It was at one point a paper birch folded so there were no seams folded up into a kind of like a tray, if you will, a bowl that was set at the base of the tree. And originally with a stone ax and then eventually with a metal ax, a diagonal slice was made near the base of the tree and the sap would run down through this cleft and a little below that would be a perpendicular cut where a spile would be inserted. But the spiles are really different. They weren't tubular. They were flat. And their job was just to guide the sap. the sap down. To so it wouldn't drain down the bark. Yeah. It would right. come off and go into the right. dish. They gathered these up. That's quite a big wound to put into the tree, so you would think that the sap flow would be fairly high from it. Yeah, I mean, but you were, we're talking, you know, a small gash that clearly healed because these people yeah. were not destroying oh, yeah, their stands. That not be my point, but meaning that that much of the oh. um, that much of the the cambium would be opened up. Yeah, so that you would get but they had, multiple yeah. vessels, and they had to get into that wood, into the xylem. Oh, okay, because the xylem's where it's actually flowing. Yes, the wood itself. So underneath right. both layers. So of the bark. sap is flowing through non-living tissue, tissue that is, has, that's correct. has skeletal tissue. Most people don't realize that most of a tree yeah. is actually dead. I'm not saying that but it's, it's functional, rotting. even though it's dead. That's right, but it's yeah. not living material that is growing. And there's just this little tiny ring on the outside yeah. that is laying down new cells. Yeah. But so that's why we're, we have to punch in the depth that we punch exactly. in the tree. Exactly, yeah. And so off into this birch bark container, right. which was then gathered up into birch bark buckets, which had cordage handles and things of that That's nature, amazing. all brought back to be cooked. And they had, uh, they would store sap in hollowed out logs. So I'm talking about, you know, not a rotted log again, but a good condition tree that had been felled and hollowed out through a combination of burning and chopping. That would be a reservoir and- Like a trough. Exactly. Basically. And in those, they could also boil things down using heated stones or bark containers held over the fire. Mm -hmm. So they were essentially using these bark containers. Once they had, they were saturated with the liquid, they wouldn't flame up and burn, especially so long as the flames weren't leaping up onto the basket, yeah. or excuse me, onto the bucket, the bark bucket itself. Yeah, when you describe this to me, I found it really hard to believe. To me, yeah. <laughs> birch bark is like a gasoline soaked rag. I mean, you just get, you touch it with a flame um, and you know, obviously, an ember doesn't just cause it to go up. But yeah, I mean, if you yeah. touch it with a flame, it just goes. So the and idea there's is, and there's plenty of documentation of these being put directly on the amazing. embers. It's really yeah. amazing. Um, and then um, also hot stones into troughs, or no? That's what I. That's As, what I've always heard about. I, I have read the same, but um, and I've seen it practiced, right. in, you know, on video. Yeah. Seen people do it and thought that looked really inefficient to me. This other thing that you're describing. Makes more sense. Heating to me. directly in the buckets. Yeah. And we know, like from uh, Maine indigenous who were studied for their uh, maple sugar making, um, their methods prior to having metal pots were again not using uh, clay, you know, ceramic vessels, mm. which seemed like the obvious. Uh, all of it was done being done using birch bark vessels. Yeah, that's amazing. I really like the uh, interplay of birch and maple yeah. as two species here, you know? And I also was thinking about, you know, I was just talking about the pancakes with acorn and it's like, this, these couple of practices connect you to these species that are otherwise, I think, if you haven't had a, a deep nature immersion, are just building materials. It's like here, this is a maple floor. We're yeah, right? yeah, it's right, like, right. Oh, that's birch tabletop. Yeah, it becomes it becomes more than just this abstract species mm -hmm. that you know about that is yeah. in the forest. It's a species that feeds you. And the great thing about reciprocal conservation when we're using things is we leave these trees standing. The trees not only get benefit from that, but everything that needs maples the insect larvae that overwinter mm -hmm. under the bark, the nut hatches that eat the larvae, all the plants that grow in the shade of maples, everybody benefits because those trees become so valuable yeah. to us. 
we don't want to turn them into a sugar beet plantation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> wow, it's really interesting with, uh, and you just brought up sugar beets, and I think, uh, again, to point out to people that a lot of sugar that they've eaten throughout their life has come from beets, not just from sugar cane, but, but sucrose is also in these sugar beets. And, yeah. and I believe that there are some GM sugar beets now, right? Uh, yes, I understand, yeah. Yeah, so this is an interesting but these, component. Yeah, these are places where there was once a natural community, yep. and if there was Hewn a forest, <laughs> leveled yeah. monoculture of yeah. crops, and obviously getting your sugar from a tree that requires a very small hole, something that the trees can heal, especially with the new spiles, these 5 16 diameter that we're talking about. Um, in, in as little as two years, that hole is completely sealed. We're, we're talking about something that is a much more uh, ecologically responsible. Mm. Now, of course, we've gone into a lot of plastic tubing and things, which has its own problems. But I'm talking about the folks that are doing it all with reusable stainless steel uh, and metal buckets and things that can last for generations. Mm -hmm. And if somebody's got a sugar bush, uh, again, we'll leave the commercial producers out of this for now, although I think yeah, I'm divided on how I really feel about it all. I think yeah. you know, there's so, it's so nice, the idea that there's this wild food that supports local economies that's in the marketplace and it's available to people and it's available especially to people. when you look into all of its health benefits mm -hmm. which yeah which i'm excited to get to with you um at the same time there's a lot of um infrastructure and a lot of waste and all that but that said do you when you when somebody's managing a sugar bush actively managing it it is keeping a forest intact to some degree but there is, and it's not going to be a monoculture, obviously, like the way... Uh, right. And I, and I just learned that um, one of the components of having an organic certification for a maple syrup producer is that they can't take away everything but the maples. They have to leave other trees in the system. It's like shade-grown coffee, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Yeah. When you grow coffee in the shade of trees, it's not like you planted it in an intact forest. There's a little bit of you know, removal of trees, a little bit of pruning, but you still leave a mostly intact habitat there. Mm -hmm. in, in our sugar bush where we gather, we've done nothing, mm -hmm. right? But that's because we're not looking, we don't have a financial incentive mm -hmm. to clear out all the trees, give the sugar maples all the light, all the moisture, all the soil food, so to speak. Um, so ours is just an intact forest. The, the commercial um, maple syrup producers certainly do some forestry activity, mm -hmm. but yet when you were to walk through these, as we've both been into these before, it's a forest. Mm -hmm. There are still species there that other species interact with. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not the same as agriculture. Yeah, and I, I know uh, your friends with Sam Thayer, and he's talked about his sugar bush. I think he's tapping the silver maples, so he's got that kind of floodplain environment, I assume, because he's got um, ramps growing up, he says, in his sugar bush. And that idea was really interesting to me. And it's not something, obviously, that I can do here, but the idea that you, you have multiple crops, wild crops coming up right. in that environment is really cool versus a... Uh, but we were talking before, I, I got us off track there because we were talking about uh, how this was done pre-industry. Oh, mm -hmm. And one question I had for you is, I, I hear people say all the time, that the native you know, peoples here would remove ice, that they would purposely leave the sap out in these troughs, and at night when freezing temperatures would occur, they would lift that piece of ice out and I toss mean, it. We do the same. Okay, that's a question I had for you because I'm seeing a lot of conflicting data on this. The, the commercial producers are back and forth on what's the sugar content of the ice. Maybe you should check the sugar content of your ice before you toss it. I've been tossing mine. I taste it and find it's much less sweet than the sap. Yeah, I mean, when water starts to form, it's, uh, excuse me, when ice begins to form in the sap, just like with anything, it's mostly pure water that's mm -hmm. freezing. I mean, yeah. you see this in other places around the world um, where they're getting, they're getting ice because it's much more pure than maybe the water body that it was forming in. And, and we know that it concentrates the sugars. If we let it freeze down and we have a bucket that's filled with sap and it freezes so there's very little liquid very left, liquid. I mean, the concentration of sugars is unmistakable. Yeah. We always discard yeah. it. And this would have been happening, um, it's not like a 
plan strategy like I'm gonna do it five times it happens when oh the temperature is gonna work yeah, out it happens tonight. It happens. so let's go grab the buckets and of course with metal pails now the ice forms on top and all the way around touching the metal and the bottom so there's a big pocket of sap we punch a hole oh, is that what you do yeah and pour the sap out yeah. or however you do it but yeah the ice forms on the total exterior yeah. of the sap in your steel bucket in the steel bucket because a lot of times I'll have the the aluminum buckets will fill with ice and at the bottom will be a, a very very sweet liquid we use this um, freezing strategy when the temperatures are right, not just in the pails that are on the trees, but also back in this big container where yeah. we put it in. We'll let it overnight in that and it'll freeze up and there'll be a big layer of ice there that will take Lift off the off. top. And that just, the least, uh, or excuse me, it needs less fuel to get it right. down to. Right. But, uh, but you can't just keep using freezing temperatures because even if it got brutally cold to do it, it won't taste like maple syrup. That flavor comes from heat caramelizing the sugars yeah, yeah. otherwise it just turns into a super sweet liquid yeah <laughs> yes yeah, exactly sugar water so that's what's interesting to me too i well actually I'll, I'll come back to that i've been thinking about laying um my sap out on cold nights in hotel pans so that i have yeah. more surface area so yeah, that i can yeah. increase the amount of freezing but i have noticed if my buckets freeze on the tree i'll hold that i'll pick that thing off the tree hold down that ice so it doesn't hit me in the face and yeah. tip that bucket up to sip from it. And I mean, this, the concentration of sugar is incredible. Um, I wanna talk about what you just mentioned, which is the, what brings out those flavors. I was always under the impression that the difference between an A grade and B grade, which are no longer the, the, the way that they're labeling yeah, right. syrups. Um, I think they've come up with something that makes a little more sense to the consumer at this point. But, but the A and the B, the light and the dark, I always thought this was sort of like a, how it was filtered or, or pouring off the premium. Now understand that the lower your sugar content is in your sap, the longer you have to boil because you have to remove more water, the more caramelization you get, the darker you get. That's how I understand that. That's, that's part of it, but it changes through the season as well because we'll get lighter colored syrups Earlier. early in the year and then much darker so part of it is the phytochemistry that's increasing because i would assume that the one way to look at the season unfolding is metabolically right for the tree for we're looking right. at it from a very um anthropocentric model sure. like what do i get but <laughs> yeah. yeah but what's going on is metabolic for the tree so yeah. so just like a lot of other plants as the season's progressing the tree is beginning to come back to life produce more chemistry so that's part of what's darkening this area right. But uh, I guess my question would be if I was to, to be able to reduce, because this is another interesting thing I read recently that, as you know, a lot of commercial producers are using reverse osmosis and this removes something like 90% of the water before they go boil, which saves right. them quite a bit of, of fuel. But they end up with a darker syrup, which is counterintuitive because you would think that the RO removing it, you'd have less boiling, therefore less, concentra less, less caramelization, right, but that isn't right. what they get for some reason. So I'm curious what would happen if I, I haven't got to really pay attention to the color of batches mm. over time that I've done with, with ice removed from syrup. Yeah, and we're, we're at home, we're focusing on just making syrup. Mm -hmm. And you know that B grade, kind of the dark amber yeah, yeah. syrup that some people, oh, that's just cooking syrup. You know, from the <laughs> homes that have done it, you, you yeah. know, that are, that have family members in the industry who make this yeah. really amazing, finely filtered product. We don't do that. You know, ours, we filter it through a cloth, leave it at that. We get sediment in the bottom, a little bit of sediment, the so-called sugar sand, which coincidentally is really important uh, nutritionally because most of it's calcium citrate. Mm -hmm. it's a, which, is an, which is a bioavailable calcium. Yeah, it's usable. And so, so long as you don't mind a little bit of this uh, texture at the very Chalky bottom texture, kind of. it's it's uh, like a grittiness mm -hmm. just a little bit um, you're actually getting much more mineral nutrition because it, it's not just calcium you know there's these other minerals uh, magnesium uh, zinc manganese mm -hmm. there's this other stuff in it and and so this unfiltered stuff you're actually you're getting some more nutrition out of it so we don't we don't go for this high-end product that's light amber perfectly filtered mm -hmm. um, because one it'd be hard for us to make that but two we recognize we get more nutrition out of the product we make at home yeah we were seeing the high pressure filter systems that they use which oh, yeah. which work off diatomaceous earth which i thought was interesting so yeah. here you've got like a fossilized microorganisms <laughs> you know it's fascinating but 
uh, my neighbor who you know, um, Sugars as well, and he came over the other day and I sort of, he's looking at my, all my syrup out on the counter. And he's like, oh, it's a nice stash, but uh, what's all this stuff at the bottom? And then he's like, look at this. And he's showing me his bottle. And it is like pure amber, no sediment. Yeah, yeah. And I was thinking like, you might as well like wave a you know, loaf of white bread in front of me because it's like, <laughs> you know, I appreciate it from an aesthetic perspective. Oh, but no yeah, doubt. What, what's and that, And that pure maple experience with just the syrup texture, like I understand it has a place, mm -hmm. but uh, on our acorn pancakes, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the guy digging my spoon down to the bottom of yours and pulling yeah. out, <laughs> out the sand. Exactly. Um, let's talk a little bit about this. Um, a lot of people are concerned about sugar today. Um, that's become, you know, we were just talking yesterday, some folks and I, about the idea that this would be the time in history where, um, this is a little off topic, but like I was thinking, there's never been a time in history where meat's been less popular. Oh, right. Ever in history, right? It's right. always been one of the most sought after things, right? And, and now we're at this place where people are like disdain it, right? It's a sort of maybe a suicidal path, but okay. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, similar with sugar. I don't know that sugar's ever been see so demonized because um, of, of the appreciation, not just for its flavor, but for the calories. Now, like we were talking about with containers, we're now we're drowning in containers. Right. We have too many, and now it's like they seem like a problem. Uh, when most of human history was trying to seek them out. Yes. Sugars are like that. We have such abundant sugar that there's concern about that, and in particular sucrose because it's that disaccharide, raises blood sugar very quickly, as you know. Being being one part glucose, one part fructose, it's like blood sugar, sugar, mm -hmm. and fruit sugar right. bound together, comes apart on your palate, feels doubly as sweet. Uh, anybody who's tried to sweeten a recipe with honey knows it's not as easy with just glucose and fructose right. that are already separated to get sweetness, but the disaccharide form of it is very, very sweet, the best. Um, very concentrated. That's what's in maple sugar. So I think a lot of people are concerned that um, this is the same as eating white sugar. Um, so I'm interested in, in, in this crude extract would be a way to talk about maple syrup. It's a crude extract of the tree. That's right. There's it's a lot an extract going on you can there. make at home. You don't right. need a chemistry set to create it. <laughs> Correct. So yeah. what actually is all in it? And let's start maybe um, from the, the vitamin and mineral perspective and then move into the other phytochemistry. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are some B-complex vitamins and we talked about some of the minerals already. Calcium zinc, magnesium. And but they're th stable at the temperatures. Yeah, that we're yeah, at. they're not destroyed. The big one though that's really important is the manganese concentration in syrup. Manganese is something your body needs and it's this essential cofactor for one of our endogenous antioxidants. Uh, superoxide dismutase, Crucial, our right body now. makes it, we would be dead without it. And manganese is super important for building one of the forms of this antioxidant. And maple syrup is just loaded with it. Wow. Uh, it provides more than many substances that I know when it comes to foods. And so it's actually giving your body what it needs to fight free radical damage. And now, superoxide dismutase is involved in, in oh, yeah. repair of, of genetic material, I right? Mean, all, all, a whole suite of yeah, processes, yeah. yeah. But not to mention there's been um, at least eight antioxidants other than what we just talked about that have been found in maple syrup. And I mean, now when they're really starting to study the phenolic compounds found in it, there's been a hundred bioactive compounds that are now known. And it's really crazy. Uh, for example, uh, some of them actually inhibit the production of carbohydrate uh, hydrolyzing enzymes. In other words, these are the compounds that are enzymes that our body makes to break down glucose and starches and maple syrup has compounds that inhibit the production of those slowing enzymes. That increase it in blood slows sugar. the blood sugar spike uptake, down. Yeah. That's right. And we have other plants on our landscape that do that. Blueberries, eastern white pine, chaga, the, mm -hmm. the, you know, the sclerotium that grows on birch trees. We have some other things that do that, but maple syrup turns out to be one of the foods that well, do that. Well, I just want to point out that I eat a lot of maple syrup with chaga and blueberries. Yeah. So <laughs> I think it's a good, yeah, you yeah. know, I just shared with you today a chaga, a, a maple syrup yeah. with chaga cooked into it. And very often that's all going on top of blueberry pancakes. I think that's a fun. A fun but it, but it, it keeps going. Uh, there are compounds, and these again are polyphenols. These are water soluble compounds that have been shown to um, help 
with neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and wow. ALS. Um, they're actually showing that while there isn't a cure for Alzheimer's, the proteins that become misfolded and bound and form plaques, that this inhibits that misfolding mm. of like wow. beta amyloid proteins and things like that. Um, they've been shown to synergistically work with um, antibiotics. In other words, they potentiate their really? effects. So now you need less antibiotic oh. to get the same effect. Uh, Anti-inflammatory compounds in maple, syrup. in maple syrup. The point is, is that one, this isn't just a sugar. It's a classic wild food that comes with this whole suite of natural compounds that do amazing things inside our body. Um, wow. You know, whereas white sugar takes up resources to deal with this when it comes into our body, maple sugar and maple syrup are giving us phytochemistry, giving us nutrition, and giving us energy. It's, it's just not the same. Not all sugars are created equal. Wow. You know, have you heard these, these reports, these ethnographic reports of um, Europeans watching gaunt, sort of late winter native peoples Who've, who've just made it through you know, the, the leanest time of the year, right. going into the sugar bushes and coming out just sort of glowing and, and healthy, right? Yeah, I, I have read these kind of accounts where, I mean, you think about it when hunter-gatherers would move into their sugar bushes um, where there were these large stands of maples, they would be doing all this work of gathering every day and boiling and gathering and boiling and they don't have time to be doing a lot else. There's all this work going on. And maple syrup in that uh, process of reducing it down to create maple sugar is one of the foods that they would be consuming mm -hmm. as to keep them going. And there are reports of people, for example, from the Great Lakes region of consuming mostly maple syrup for weeks and being fully nourished as a result of this, <laughs> much like what you're describing. Yeah, I mean, I'm experiencing that at a much lower level, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. my <laughs> consumption of maple syrup in the last month has been off the charts. I, I can't, I would not want to know my blood sugar, <laughs> but I have, I mean, I feel great from it. I really, really enjoy this time of year, and I like the way, and, and a big focus at, for Wild Fed is, <clears throat> what does a modern person look like when they become a hunter-gatherer, mm. not what does it look like if we try to emulate hunter-gatherers of the past, but when we actually hunt and gather, what lifestyle emerges. One of the things that I wanted to touch on, and you sort of lightly mentioned it earlier, was this workload that comes with it uh, comes at a time when we're just finishing out the ice fishing season, which keeps me active for the, a good part of the winter, right. but then there comes this sort of lull as the oxygen levels in the water start dropping down and the season starts slowing down, the pressure's been really high on the fish, start backing off that and then it's like a little bit of, I'm getting a little antsy in the house and then it starts and, and I'm carrying yeah. buckets. And now you're outside, you're carrying heavy buckets, mm -hmm. three, five gallon pails, whatever, filled with sap. Uh, we also have, as I mentioned, have to sled hours back, which I've read historical accounts of indigenous yeah putting barrels of sap on toboggans to get them back to yeah. where they were blowing down. You're moving, uh, so we're snowshoeing out to hours, pulling sleds, lifting buckets, outside getting fires going. All, you're active and uh, yeah, you come, if there was such a thing as a winter slumber, you definitely come out of it as you kick off the foraging season with maple sap. Yeah, I really, really enjoy the work that is yeah. required. and. Anytime somebody points out to me a way that you could simplify your system by just having these tubes or this, um, I wanted to bring up too now. You're missing the point. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. it's not yeah. just the nutrition. Yeah. It's about the movement as well. It is about the movement. <laughs> Similar to when we ice fish and it's, oh, it's a mile walk out on the ice and somebody says, oh, do you want to lift on the snow machine? It's like, no, I, I need this. <laughs> yeah. I need and this. And in fact, so do you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. More. Um, yeah, but I think that that, that movement's crucial. And then it's that early outdoors, uh, that sun's just coming in, I'm starting to get some sun on my face, I'm drinking that sap constantly. It, it, point it replaces almost, spring water. Yeah, yeah, this just time living of year. off that sap for a while, I'm blending everything with that sap. I mean, I really, really enjoy that Not time. Not to mention with this system where you actually visit the trees, because this is becoming rare. Yeah, even I even good see point. small homes where they have 10 or 15 mm -hmm. sugar maple trees, and it's all blue plastic tubes now. 
I actually want to get up and visit every tree, yes. put my hand yes. on the stem, look at the crown, yes. offer gratitude. It's so true. I want the connection. I can't even, sometimes in our practices, I find myself reminding myself to give gratitude because I come from a culture that doesn't. And, Absolutely, yeah. And it's not been my habit throughout life. There's other times when it just, I can't, we were talking about bear hunting earlier. I can't not, it just, because I'll notice if, we're, if I'm fishing and it's a very, a very active day and I'm catching a lot of fish and I start off saying, thank you, thank you, thank you, you know, in my, at least internally, I'm, I'm yeah. feeling that gratitude. And then sometimes it just sort of goes away because I'm so, it's so much action. Right. But if you kill a bear, for instance, it's like, um, it's overwhelming, right? You feel it in an overwhelming way. When I walk up to a tree, Especially if I've been, oh, this bucket's a quarter filled, this one's got a third, and then I walk up to a tree that's full. I can't, it's just like, <laughs> thank it's you. It's very like, much the same It just thing. overwhelms you when you see it's like I, overflowing at the edges. I wish people could experience, you're just walking out into this forest and it's giving you sugar. Yes. Like, I know. We're so lucky. All of your sugar for the year. Yeah. I, I feel like I drive down, now I'm not saying that it would, I don't want this to be misinterpreted as I think every tree on the planet needs to get tapped, but it's like I drive through my town and I see these trees so much healthier, so much bigger, so much more sun, such big, so much bigger of a crown, and they're just untapped everywhere, and people are importing all this sugar, and I think like... From a long we, way away. From very far away. <laughs> and with, they've got with, it outside their home. Right outside yeah. their home, and, yeah. or, or, or you know, all through the town, where it's like the town could do it, or, or whatever, it just, it's hard to and, see. And there's a lot of wild food myths, you know? Like, people, I always recommend if you don't, you don't have to go make all your sugar you need for the, make a little bit. Because mm -hmm. you learn, and you, you learn to value this tree, even if you're doing just a small bit. Yep. And people, oh, well, you can't bring it inside and make it in your house, because it's going to take the wallpaper, the wallpaper off. off. And, and I have... So people know what you mean, the steam. Yeah. All that steam that you're As it's off. evaporating from mm -hmm. this water, it's going to just destroy your house. And I just want to be clear, like in Maine, for example, many homes are heated with wood of some form through the year, and the houses are dry. Mm. You're, all you're doing is rehydrating your house. But I did this for years in a home with wallpaper and nothing happened. Mm -hmm. People talk about, well, the walls will get all sticky. Well, that's, it's just water coming off. Yes, it's not it's sugar. sugar. <laughs> but there's all of these yeah. things that you read that stop people mm -hmm. from wanting to make even just a small batch in their home to see what the process yeah. is like. And I just recommend doing it because you'll gain an appreciation again for that tree outside your home, even if you're just making a small jar of syrup. There's a few things there I want to hit on. Um, I have made it in my house in small batches, and I finish all my batches indoors. So as well. do I. Yeah. Um, the steam is not an issue, and if you have an overhead vent, especially one that vents the outdoors, right. like I have a cooking hood that vents the outdoors, I just turn that on, and all that steam's going right out the house anyway. If you, as you mentioned, if somebody has a wood stove, then they act, have an active fire that they can actually mm. cook right yeah, on top right. of. Um, I want to talk about. Uh, ways to get started and first thing I want to say is that I, I did this and a lot of people um, that I talk to online are doing this they get started by going you know what I'm not even gonna try to make syrup yet I just want to get some sap and I want to drink it and it's like what a great way to start right? yeah it, it's you know you you have talked about this in the past it's our coconut water well and you've written about it too actually I think you did you did more justice to it than I am yeah but the, but the yeah. point is it's like our coconut water yeah. it's a sweetened drink that comes out of nature in this case that has trace minerals, trace vitamins, trace antioxidants, trace phytochemistry that benefits us, and it's all there. Just and an extremely low sugar content. If somebody's like, oh, it's, maple syrup's not for me, I'm on a low sugar diet. No, but it's this like, is two to three percent. Yeah. This is just perceptibly sweet. It, mm -hmm. This isn't syrup. Yeah, very subtle. Oh, and, and that, that is the best way. Just go mm -hmm. out, make a small wound in the tree, collect the sap, and you're good to go. I mean, it would take minutes for somebody to get one started yeah. and hang a bucket on it. Minimal investment. I mean, if you bought nice equipment, you're looking at a couple bucks for a spile I and mean, a heck, bucket. Even you know, if you hung a plastic a milk jug yeah. or whatever yeah, on it, you just could. To, yeah, you could do it for nothing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's a great way to get started. Um, any other recommendations for people who are thinking about getting going with it or want to start tapping it? Yeah, I, would, I definitely recommend, unless you have a friend that has done it a bunch and can guide you through it, start small. Mm -hmm. You know, you, if you put out too many taps, you just won't be able to keep up with it. And, and for us right now, you learn what your um, 
obstacles are to mm -hmm. increasing your home production. And for us mm -hmm. right now, we can only evaporate so fast, yep. Yep. right? And so right now we have all the taps that we can do. And if we were gonna add more taps, we would have to have another evaporating pan. We currently use a two by three foot pan that sits over a big fire. So it's a big flat tray to maximize the amount of heat going mm -hmm. to that sap. Um, we would need another one, but I have friends who get um, a, a tray made out of stainless steel or something. It's not a huge expense and just use cinder blocks mm -hmm. to set up some kind of I was going to say, you see a lot ground. of cinder block setups. Um, I think sometimes, cut barrels in half yeah, over yeah. the open like a fire. Drum, like a steel drum. Yeah, exactly. I've also seen, and I, I, this is something I don't want to recommend, but I, I just want to say I've seen people taking uh, hotel pans, which are typically aluminum, but sometimes steel, yeah. um, and cooking on those. Now, I wouldn't suggest cooking on the aluminum, right. but point is you can get inventive. Um, to At first, I just did it literally in big four and five gallon pots on yeah. the wood stove. I didn't do anything yeah. else. They were the same pots that are in many main homes for cooking steamer clams and yeah, those yeah. kind of shellfish. Um, big, big pot. And it just sat on the wood stove and that's, and I just would check it a couple of times in the night. It'd go all night, all day during that time of year. Required no investment of special evaporating, yeah. uh, you know, wares. Any books that you like on either uh, the ethnobotany, um, you know, stuff from the past or um, anything that you can think of today. And I don't mean to put you on the spot with that, mm. uh, but is there anything that comes to mind? Well, there, there are. Um, Francis Densmore did a, a book um, primarily looking at Great Lakes natives, especially Ojibwa, and talks about how they went through their um, maple sugar production and okay. it's a really neat source there are others but that one probably does the nicest job and is really approachable and has all kinds of other uh, plants that are discussed in it um, that would be one for kind of the ethnography yeah. Sam Thayer covered in his latest book yeah. uh, he did a nice section on maple that was cool to see in there as well but the, yeah the point being that you can get into this very simply and then for me, it was exciting to see year two how much I had advanced. My production tripled. My um, my systems are much better. And you're better. problem solving. Like, oh, so this is happening. Better. I know exactly yeah. why. I can fix it. Exactly. <laughs> yep. And um, and smoothing out the kinks that that slow me down. Yeah. Um, one of the challenges I have is just I need to cut more trails because I cut a little <laughs> bit in the beginning, and then the rest of the time I have both my hands filled with buckets. <laughs> yeah. So it's hard to. And they'll be like, I have to keep walking around this stump or every time I get right. to this down tree or whatever. <laughs> uh, so I think this summer I'm going to do a little work, you know, just to make accessing. Um, I changed the trees uh, that I tapped last year to, to all being closer to my house and up higher so I don't have to go downhill and then back uphill. Yeah, yeah. And in that, I just wanted to go back to something you said, because I think it's a nice kind of point to, to finish out on is that in the, I have 50 taps out and this year, many different trees than I tapped before. The first few walks around, I would have to really look around or follow in my tracks to find those trees. And as I went on, I started to get more, you know, um, familiar know, with the route. There's one, there's one. There's yeah. And it came to the, you know, and, and it took me, it's funny, it took me a little while to realize to look up and I can just see the crowns of all the trees. But, but uh, the point is I got to know each tree after a little while. And it, so it wasn't just, uh, oh yeah, where was that again? But like, oh, it's, it's literally like going to visit you know, if you went to uh, visit dogs or cats or people, it's like you, yeah. individuals. They start to, the trees start to become individuals and you start to know that tree's a good producer, that tree's a good producer. You, you can actually, uh, certain trees do produce more than others. Some taste sweeter than yeah, others yeah. and they can be next to each other. And you do, you learn the personalities of these other than human mm -hmm. beings that you're sharing this landscape with, which is one of the whole reasons why foraging mm -hmm. and, and other pursuits like it offer this kind of connection that most people uh, don't get to experience. And I just, I feel it's unfortunate that they don't get to feel this connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And um, let's close it out by talking about what's on the horizon. You, we've just finished up here. All our buckets are cleaned. All our taps are pulled. It's, You've got a little time left, I think. Yeah, you are. funny you mention it because, you know, we're really meticulous between every batch. We're cleaning everything out, getting it all ready because we want it to be uh, as little, when I say contamination, I'm just talking about debris and yeah. things that would that maybe foam affect that the flavor. To yeah, the exactly. Edges. And reading in the ethnographic literature, uh, so were the Native Americans. Oh, they were, no kidding. Meticulous cleaning between <laughs> batches of their bark containers yeah. and, and at the end of the year because they were stashing them 
and leaving, right? Yeah. And so every get multiple years out of that equipment. Some of it, yes. They'd get multiple years out of that equipment? Yeah, some of it. Um, they, and what they would do is simply repair or rebuild, remake those things that finally had reached the end of their service life. Wow, oh, that's amazing. Yeah, um, but you know, we do have a brief lull. We could go into birch sap. It's gonna go for another eight or 10 days past maple, um, but you're dealing with really low sugar concentrations and different sugars. They're easier to scorch. You've got to cook at lower temperatures. Um, and so for the most part, we're just getting, getting ready, ready for the foraging. Um, that and the spring turkey well, hunt. The, could, yeah, <laughs> wait, I want to I get to that. <laughs> uh, birch syrup. I initially, I, I cooked off about a pint last year because I would have had probably double, but I, I lost a lot. I, I'd grown complacent with how well the sap keeps in the cold temperatures during oh, maple season, yeah, yeah. which have begun to warm by the time the birch sap is really flowing. Um, I initially didn't really know what to do with it. It was like this molasses-like flavor that right. I didn't really different. have an application for. Since then, I have found um, mixed with a, a ginger, a shoyu, a sesame oil, um, and um, uh, like a rice vinegar, mm -hmm. uh, you get an outrageous like, like um, sweet and sour sauce. So there's a way I've been using it. I've been using it on um, red meat applications as a marinade, as a marinade ingredient, so with some oil and some salt and sometimes like a balsamic. That's just incredible. And I've been using it in cocktails. So I've been finding now, I'm, I just started cruising through the birch yeah, yeah. syrup, and now I'm getting really that's excited. That's nice, because that. paper birch, yellow birch, again, so long as it's mm -hmm. big enough, it will well, run. gray birch? Or are they you, just typically not big enough? They're just typically too small. Mm -hmm. um, and so you see paper and yellow birch in this Sugar part of the world. Sugar content? I, I tapped only Much less. gold birch. La, so yeah. Yellow birch, they typically yep. say, I yep. I want to call it golden birch. Because they are kind of gold. They're golden. <laughs> but uh, do, is their sugar content different between uh, paper birch and yellow birch? Oh, no. I found pretty, it about the same. Similar. You know, but you're looking at, you know, sugar maple is like 40 to 1. In other words, 40, you know, gallons of mm. sap is needed to make a what gallon of What do you find you actually get, though? Because I get way better than that, and I'm in the red maples. I must oh, be getting 32 to 35. Yeah, we're, pr we're reasonably close to it. Yeah. Reasonably close. But... Um, the birches, you're talking 100, 120 to one. Mm. And so it's a significant more reduction, but we, we finally found our application as well. Um, it would go great, you know, that old time kind of biscuits and molasses kind of thing, it would work there, but we're using it on fish. And it is an amazing You're gonna sauce. have to make that for me, I, for me to be Sarah, sold on that idea. Sarah makes it, and uh, it's been one of the ways that, you know, sometimes like uh, it's this fish, it's a wonderful fish, but it's fish, it's a bland fish. And then this just totally really, takes huh? care of that. Yeah, so yeah, good. It's so strange to me. But. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I want to try that. Uh, and then um, you were saying turkey. That's what we got coming right after. Spring yeah. turkey. We're less, I mean, what are we? Three weeks, yeah. two and a half weeks. Yeah. Like, we're Very close. That. I'm just hearing. Yeah. And soon the greens are coming. Yeah. And, and obviously we have uh, some amazing locations where indigenous tending took place. Yeah and a place we visit year after year after year. I'm getting really excited. Hey, just want to give a plug. Um, you know, your uh, classes will probably have already, your spring class will probably already have passed by the time um, people hear this, but you run about, I think, four classes a year? Right? Yeah, and I'll do lectures around a bit. Right, so and, talk and about they, that a they, little bit just so people know where yeah, they, they find Yeah, the it. classes fill up quickly. I typically do weekend long classes, start Friday, leave Sunday, uh, have a traditional chef come in who prepares food. Um, and that way we all get to eat together. We gather wild foods and bring them back. And they're at my house in Canton, Maine. Um, but I'm, I'm fortunate they feel quickly. And so if you want to get in on these classes, I just encourage you as soon as you see them show up, go out. And they get them. that at arthurhaines.com. Yes. And I'll just put my own plug in there. I just think your classes are, are they're world class. I mean, I think well, you've been to a number of them. To, to a number of them. If yeah. you are really interested in, in learning about foraging at a subsistence level or the ability to really make medicine off your landscape, I just I highly recommend Thanks your classes. So and we'll put links to that as well as to the uh, Wilder, uh, Wilder Waters um, oh, nice. community uh, Instagram page. Um, and uh, all the rest of your media as well. Arthur, thank you uh, for being here today. And uh, Thanks for inviting me, Daniel. Daniel. Thanks for listening to the Wild Fed Podcast. You can help us grow the show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. 
Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out the Wild Fed video show and store. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.